that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. start out by answering a question that I'm sure some people are going to have when they look at me and know that I'm a keynote speaker, and that is, who is this loser? <laughs> I wouldn't say that. Oh, come on. It's Santa. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I want to tell you who I am and where I get my information uh, and, and why I'm addressing the NEC. Uh, in April of 2011, Ned, who in those great old days was the president, I think. Yeah. Um, Tim. What? <laughs> acting. Acting. Okay. Uh, he came to me and he asked me if I would put together lists of uh, news articles that had come up in the previous short time, uh, the previous day, and, and put those together with... Um, with uh, uh, a link to the original article, you know, just a synopsis of the article with a link. And when I did that and had a group of them, I would send it out in an email, and I did this on a daily basis. The reason why Ned wanted this done was because at that time, which was three weeks after the Lincoln Coalition had, um, about three weeks after the New England Coalition had, uh, um, I'm sorry, about three weeks, four weeks after the Fukushima meltdown. Um, it was New England Coalition members were going out to the news. They were trying to find uh, as much information as they could, and they were having a terrible time, not because there wasn't news recorded or reported. It was because if there was a story that was really worth reporting, it was going to appear in a couple hundred years. So uh, could, could I ask who's... Yeah, we have to have Clay put him on mute. We're hearing him typing. Yes, the okay. typing is very loud. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, what was happening was that people were looking for articles and not finding them because there was too much information. And I want to, I want to point out that there was one article that never appeared. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, the... the uh, good example that I have of this was about two weeks into this project. I remember doing a, a search on news over a 24-hour period of just two terms together. One was Fukushima and the other was nuclear and coming up with something on the order of 650 hits. Wow. 650 stories in one day in the news. And I went through those and I found Two of them, two of those stories really dominated the news. They were, they might have been as many as 400 of those 650 um, stories, uh, articles. But there were a total of eight articles that I thought were important enough to, to share, one of which appeared in only two places. So this was a, it was a hard job and having each of the members of the New England Coalition do it was not going to be fruitful. So basically what happened was I did that every day. And long about uh, May or so of 2012, I started to realize that really this whole thing should be expanded in two ways. One of which was nuclear, um, uh, the, the nuclear industry is not something that we can deal with without dealing with the context in which it exists. And the context in which it exists is energy, and climate change, pollution, and other reasons why we have to be very, very careful about what we're doing in terms of energy. And so I wanted to put that together and I wanted to also put it up as a blog so that anybody, not just New England Coalition members would be able to access it. So in, on the 2nd of June, 2012, I started my blog, geoharvey.com, and I have posted an average of 13.3 or something um, articles per day 
every day since. And when I say every day, I get up early in the morning. Um, today, I was up at two o'clock doing my, my stuff. I do take naps. And believe me, I wouldn't do it quite that drastically if I didn't suffer from insomnia. But the, the um, you know, I, I do this work and I send out, uh, I put up the blog. I still send out the emails to anybody in the NEC or anybody else who wants them. And uh, the emails are not all of the news that I put up on the blog, but about five items. And now what I'm doing is I'm putting up a shortened list of the blog on the NEC webpage, which includes all of the uh, articles that I wanted to post about nuclear. And um, this, is, this is material that I'm sharing. I, if I'm not working at four o'clock on Christmas morning, I overslept. <laughs> this is how it works. So in addition to that, once a week, Tom Fennell, who lives across the street here, and I get together and we go to the, uh, uh, the uh, studio of the, of the uh, BCTV, and we record a, an hour-long show based on materials that come from my blog. So I've got that bit. And then in addition to that, I write articles for Green Energy Times, and I write occasionally an article for Clean Technica. So, so George, just let me break in. So just so he's letting us all finally know what Santa's doing the other 364 <laughs> days of the year. But he's I blogging. He's blogging. I do it on Christmas. <laughs> anyway, um, I see a lot of trends. Doing this, I see a lot of trends. And what I'm seeing today is this. The president of the United States wants us to build new nuclear reactors. Biden? Yeah. Biden does. Are you say that? What's that? I, I just was not aware of his saying that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh yes. And he has the said. old one's running. And, and the previous president, um, Donald Trump, wants new nuclear reactors. Yeah. And you can bet your bottom dollar that anybody who's going to get elected in the next presidential election probably wants to build new nuclear reactors, if, even if that person isn't one of those two. The, our Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, wants new nuclear reactors. The, gonna get it. the people she replaced or who had worked in that post under Donald Trump wants, wanted new nuclear reactors. Jim Hansen, the guy who um, who, who brought the whole matter of climate change up to the, to the Congress of the United States, wants new nuclear reactors. Bill Gates, obviously, wants new nuclear reactors. He wants to make scads of money, and he thinks he can do it on new nuclear reactors. And by the way, Bill Gates may have things wrong with him, but he is not so proud that he not, not, doesn't admit that he fairly frequently loses money on his investments in energy. Warren Buffett wants new nuclear reactors, although my suspicion is he's hedging his bets there and he will pull out of that project when he sees it's not going to make money. But this is what we're up against. People want new nuclear reactors. People, ordinary people. I saw a poll the other day. Um, there was a question, do you, do you support nuclear? Do you support, support it strongly? Do you oppose it? Do you oppose it strongly? Obviously, there was a middle ground. The report that I saw didn't provide any information on that middle ground. But the people who responded that they supported nuclear reactors or, or didn't, of those people, 76% want new nuclear reactors. Two thirds of the states of the United States have governments that are looking for new nuclear reactors. Now, that's a lot of people who know a lot of things. I, I don't think Jen, uh, uh, Jennifer Granholm is a stupid woman. And I don't think Warren Buffett is a stupid man. But I will tell you that all of those people, in my opinion, having looked at all those stories over the last 10 years, all of those people are just plain 
wrong. Just plain wrong. I'm going to go a little further than that. I'm going to say there is not one reason why we should build a nuclear reactor. Not one. They don't provide anything for us except that they provide money for people who have invested in them. That's all they provide. From the point of view of climate change, I'm going to say Jim Hansen is wrong. And I think I can show this is the case. Building a new nuclear reactor will provide us with relatively carbon-free electricity <clears throat> sometime way down the road <clears throat> at a very high cost. If you compare that with renewable energy, the renewable energy is going to take a third of the time and it's going to cost half to a third as much. And on top of everything else, it's going to give us better quality electricity. Now, what is better quality electricity? I'll get into that. But it's, it, it will be more reliable. Nuclear re uh, power is not reliable. Not the way we need it. I, sh I should take a little break here. I want you to consider for a moment the question of baseload power. We've heard that term come up. Hi. We've heard that term come up, baseload power. And honestly, I think the reason why all these people support nuclear power is because they believe that we need baseload power. And the, 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 the argument that I have here in favor of this is the sun doesn't always shine, the, moon, the wind doesn't always blow. I was going to say the moon doesn't always blow. The wind doesn't always blow. And um, we need baseload power to know that, the, that when we throw the switch in the bathroom at 2 o'clock in the morning, on a sunny morning in the spring, the lights will come on. That is wrong. It may have been true 30 years ago, but it's not true today. I wonder how many people actually know what baseload power is and, and why it's called baseload. Well, I can tell you, the base load is the lowest demand that will appear on, the, on a grid during a period of time. So you can have a base load for a day, a week, a year. And the, if you're going to build a base load power plant, it should provide for not all of, but a, a large part of the expected base load during the lifetime of the plant. Now, if you think about that, that means the baseload power plant is not going to provide all the electricity. It can't. It cannot provide all of the electricity. It is not possible to provide all the electricity for a grid from plants that are designed to, to supply the minimum amount. It can't be done. The, now, why is baseload power important? Well, this is something that goes back to the 1920s, 100 years ago. They wanted to get people electricity as cheaply as they possibly could. And they had to wean people away from gas lights and kerosene. The way to do that is to make electricity cheap. And the way to do that is to build power plants that can produce electricity as cheaply as possible as cheaply as possible. And the way to do that is to build power plants that don't have any bells and whistles. And what that means in terms of power plants is they cannot ramp up and down convenient. That ramping up and down costs a lot of money. So you leave that out of the plant. You just tell the plant operator, run 100% of the time at 100% of output. And you'll do just great because that's what a baseload power is supposed to do. That's why it's cheap. That's why it was needed 100 years ago. Now, today, we have weird things happening. And I want to point out nuclear plants are, that we have in operation today are all baseload plants. The small modular reactors that may come might not be baseload plants. They might have load-following features built into them. 
that suggests to me that they're they're actually going to provide electricity at a higher price. But the 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 baseload plants also include coal, um, oil burning plants, natural gas, certain kinds of natural gas plants, and they provide that baseload. Then, in addition to that, you need to have load following plants. Hydropower can be used for that purpose. Can also sometimes be used for base load, but really it's a load following um, uh, plant. If the if the um, uh, grid needs more electricity, the hydropower plant will be asked if they can produce more. If they need less electricity, the hydropower plant will be asked if they can produce less. So what happens here is that the the base load plants that we have. All of our nuclear plants are baseload, can only produce a portion of the electricity and the extra electricity. The ones that comes from load following plants, from peaker plants, from other kinds of plants, all costs extra. Now let's go back to what happened with Vermont Yankee a couple of years before it shut down. The people at Vermont Yankee came to the state of Vermont and they said, we're gonna off offer you power at a price you can't refuse. Here's Ned back here laughing. <laughs> they offered us electricity at six and a half cents per kilowatt hour. That was a, a, a price too cheap to refuse. That was a deal that was too good to refuse, except we refused it. And it wasn't because we hated nuclear. It was because we could get it cheaper from Hydro-Quebec. <laughs> now, I want you to bear in mind, six and a half cents is the cheapest they were willing to give us from a plant that was already paid down. If it were a new plant, it would have cost at least double that. What I'm seeing coming up over and over and over and over again, and I've been seeing this for a long time, the price of electricity from wind power is going down. I should, I should be doing that a different way, this way. <laughs> the, price the price of solar is going down like a rock. And as fast as the price of solar power is going down, the price of batteries is just tumbling. Wow. 23% per year on average. This is, this is mind boggling. <clears throat> so I see prices of power purchase agreements come in. Power purchase agreements that include solar and battery or sometimes wind and battery. A really good one, which would produce a very low price, would be solar plus wind plus battery. <laughs> and, and really, the, I'm, telling, I'm telling you the truth here. Solar power, nah, you don't get it at night. It's great stuff during the day because that's when the demand is highest. But the other thing that's interesting about solar power is wind power doesn't really come on during the day very well. And it's not really great during the summer. When the sun is shining, the wind is not really blowing. But when the sun is not shining, that's when the wind is blowing. So what does it tell you? It tells me that if you wanted to design a grid and you were willing to overbuild things a bit in order to get what you want, you could build a grid that would work on just solar and wind, and a little battery, and a little hydro. Throw them all together, you got a great grid. Prices that have gone below four cents per kilowatt hour. How is a small modular reactor going to compete with that? How? Government subsidies. Yeah. Oh my golly. <laughs> Ned, don't say that. People <laughs> will believe you. <laughs> the, the, the cost of, this is another thing that people should understand. I don't know how many people, I know that there, there are probably a lot of economists who have never heard of Wright's Law. Wright's Law is a law of, econ of economics which is actually recognized. People in, at MIT have investigated Wright's Law, they've done studies on it. You know, this is, this is serious stuff. They've looked at it, what they found is, yeah, it works. And the way that it works is you see a technology, the technology comes online, the price goes down because the first models that come up are expensive. And as people learn to make those cars, magnesium, cal uh, uh, 
uh, magnesium chlorate, whatever it is that they're, that they're making. And in this case, we're talking about, about solar modules, wind turbines, batteries. As, the, as they learn how to make them more efficiently and they get better uh, technology, uh, the, the price just keeps going down. The interesting thing about this is if you, if you take the price decrease that you get as time passes and more, more, more importantly, the number of, of units in the, in, the, in the world has doubled. If you take the doubling of the number of units in the world and you look at the percent of decrease, you're going to get the same percentage of decrease the next time the number has doubled. And that will go on and on and on. And they have tested this. And this is why, for example, there's Moore's law that says that the price of computers is high, it was high, but it just kept going down at a certain rate. And when the people at MIT compared Moore's law with Wright's law, they discovered they're not identical. Wright's law actually works better. It's the law that ordinary people know as the learning curve. And what it says about solar and wind is that the price will go down. The price of batteries will go down. What does it say about the price of nuclear? <laughs> well, it's interesting. It says the price will always go up. <laughs> right. Rice Law says the price of nuclear power is going to continue going in the direction it's going. And the direction it's been going is up. Now, it may be that when they get small modular reactors, that'll make a difference. But is it really going to make a difference? The people who want to sell these reactors will tell you that it does. But, you know, here I am. Take the number of articles that I've posted. It's, it's about 47,000 articles that I've posted. And I've had to look at probably in excess. I, I actually counted this four times. Every time it was, it was in excess of 27 articles on average to find the one I posted. Do the math. That's one and a quarter million articles, titles I've looked at. That's a lot. Okay. As, as, as we have been, as I've been seeing this go on, the price of nuclear goes up. The price of solar and wind goes down. And this is something that's an ongoing thing. Now, the price of nuclear electricity from nuclear plants, oh, there was one other thing that I wanted to mention. One of the things that I found in looking at all those articles is that numbers from the nuclear industry actually come in three different flavors. There's three different kinds of numbers. Now, one kind of number that I'm talking about here is numbers that are accurate. That's the first kind. Those numbers are the numbers that happen when the engineers do simple calculations, which means that if you give them a reactor design and say, what are we going to get out of this? Or if they come up with a reactor design and say that, and they say 900 megawatts, they mean 900 megawatts. They're going to give you 900 megawatts. They're going to be smack dab on the money. And if you happen to kind of push that a little beyond so that they get a little bit more out of it. No, nah, they pull it back. They say, you're not allowed to do that. And if you, if it turns out that it doesn't meet the total that they said it would, then it's weird because they, they've never done it. They're accurate. The second kind of number that they come up with is numbers that are, I, I always refer to them as numbers that are off by a factor of two, but Really, these numbers are mostly in the neighborhood of two to four that they're off by. And these are numbers that have to do with timelines and costs. So if they say that a reactor is going to cost $6 billion to build, what they really mean, well, I don't know if that's what they mean. <laughs> what I mean is, if you're, if, you're, if you're wise, you will say, they say $6 billion, we'd better expect that it'll cost twelve. To 24. To 24, but, you know, at least 12. And if they say it's going to take five years, well, that if you're smart, we'll tell you that it's going to be 10 to 20. 
And this is what's going on in that rea- set of reactors that you mentioned there, that's yeah. down in Georgia. They were, I don't remember what the initial amount was, but they're now, now up to $30 billion for those two reactors. 1.1 gigawatts each. They're way, way beyond when they were due. And there's all kinds of political scandals around it. it it's, a, it's, it's just a matter of shambles. Now, this is where we get into the comparison of solar plus batteries with nuclear. This is really interesting. I think it was on the 5th of August of last year, um, there was an article that appeared in PV Magazine. And if you go to my blog, geoharvey.com, and you go back to August, and you look at the 6th, it would have been the day that this appeared. It might have been the 7th that it appeared, but it's in, in those days, sort of. There was an article in which a person compared the costs of two plants, one of which was the plant in, in Georgia that had it by that time already gone to $27.5 billion. He said it was 30 because he was accounting finance costs. Um, and now it's gone up another billion dollars. Um, he said, okay, you're gonna get, you're gonna get two gigawatts of base load power, 2.2 gigawatts for $30 billion. This particular person was, um, was, had um, skill as a designer of solar power with battery backup. And so he said, okay, I'm gonna design a solar plant that is going to replace those nuclear reactors altogether. And he said, okay, what this means is that solar plant is gonna to have to produce the replacement on an annual basis, and it's going to have to produce the electricity that that plant in Georgia would produce in the depths of winter. So he he designed a, a monumentally big um, uh, photovoltaic plant that was backed up by monumentally big batteries, which of course were not going to be in one place in Georgia. They were going to be all over the state. And by the way, there's something that I should mention about solar. Um, there are certain kinds of uh, articles that I always look into. I should say stories that I always look into. The story might be represented by several articles. One is any combination of wind power and human health. Another is any combination of wind power and property values. Another is an in, any combination of wind power and animal mortality, including bats and birds. Another one, however, is a, any combination of solar power and agriculture. And in that regard, I'd like to just kind of briefly mention two studies. Actually, there were more than two studies, two different places that were studying those fault problems. One was the University of, uh, of Arizona, I believe. It was in Arizona, it was a university. The other one was the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany, which spends a lot of time looking at, at solar power. Both of these places experienced exactly the same result when they put uh, photovoltaic panels over areas where there were crops. In both places, the the crops were producing under the panels and then identical uh, uh, fields were next to them, not under the panels. And in both places, when they planted potatoes, the ones under the solar panels produced more. (laughs) <laughs> this is this is so amazing. It's so lovely. Why did they produce more? Well, it was a hot summer in Germany, and the potatoes didn't like drying out. Well, under the solar panels, they didn't dry out as easily. They were in the shade. They didn't need that much sun. And there are a lot of plants that don't need that much sun. And in fact, you know, we've got pawpaws now growing in Brattleboro because you know, with climate change, they can grow in Brattleboro. <laughs> And those pawpaws, um, one of the things that I've read is they shouldn't even be allowed to see the sun until they're at least 18 inches tall. They they are, the ones that do well, grow in shade. They're they're plants that grow below the canopy. Anyway, 
Her friend who was pricing solar panels in Georgia to compete with nuclear plants, this price, the, 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 his systems to replace the nuclear plants. And he discovered, lo and behold, the job could be done for $17 billion. <laughs> so you could save $13 billion, at least, by not have, thank you, Liz, by not having the, the nuclear plants there to begin with. This is crazy. Why would we build nuclear plants? Well, we need baseload power, sorry. The batteries are built into this one. The batteries will provide you with baseload power, but they'll also provide you with things that are better. This is really interesting. And this is where we get into the question of quality of electricity. How can one kilowatt hour be better than another kilowatt hour? Question? The answer to that is it can be reliable in terms of its cycles. If you have a nuclear power plant or, a, or another baseload power plant and it's backed up by load following plants and so forth, in the old days, I don't know how this is done, but the way I envision it is somebody's monitoring the grid and it says, whoops, our, our demand is going up. So he picks up the phone and says to the operator who answers the phone, because that's what operators did in those days. Um, I need to talk with, and then he'd give the number, and she would dial it for him because ordinary phones didn't have dials. Remember, we're talking about the 1920s. Uh, and this was the way things were when I was a kid in the 19, early 1950s. Um, and he calls up Joe and he says to Joe, listen, we need more electricity. Could you put a little more on? I mean, open that valve a little bit. And, and you know, the hydro plant will produce a little more. Okay, okay, bye. That is how the base, base load plus load following paradigm worked. If they needed to start up another plant, they'd start up another plant. Best quality plant for this was gas. Why? Because it starts faster. The problem is load following plants are gonna produce electricity. You remember the six and a half cents we were talking about and the four cents? They're gonna produce electricity at you know 18 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, or more. Uh, that's pretty close to what we're paying retail. Well, Green Mountain Power has to pay even higher prices. And I've talked to people up there who have referred to bad times when they had to pay 60 cents per kilowatt hour for electricity because that's what was needed. And the people who were buying the electricity at home were paying 18 cents per kilowatt hour for electricity that was costing Green Mountain Power 60 cents per kilowatt hour. So this is a, this is a you know, different, it, it's different from what most people think. By comparison, that, that guy who designed the PV plants for Georgia, I got news for you. If the demand changes, the computer sees that the demand changes and it can change the output from the battery to meet that demand in less than one cycle. Now, the best that they were doing in the old days was 15 minutes uh, in with really fast response, three minutes. They can do it in less than one cycle, less than one sixtieth of a second. In fact, they can do it in a thousandth of a second, which means that the quality of the electricity that you're getting is, it's always going to have the same sine wave form. When the load following plants can't meet the change in demand, the way they typically do it, they, they change the, the number of cycles per second. Right. Yeah, which means that your clock runs a little slower <laughs> or a little faster. As a matter of fact, the way that they do it is they keep track of how much your clock is going to be behind, be behind during the course of a day, and they make up for that by running a little faster later on. <laughs> I mean, okay. Hey, George, do you want yeah. to start? Can you wrap it? Can you start wrapping it up? I will start wrapping it up. Okay. What I'm getting at here is the electricity is better. 
And, and there are other form, ways in which it is better because that plant in Georgia performs as a nuclear, as well as a nuclear plant in the middle of the winter. But in the summer, it's going to produce twice as much electricity. And that electricity is going to be really, really cheap. Nuclear is not going to hold up. Nuclear is not going to hold up when it's compared on any basis. We don't need to pay extra for nuclear because we need um, baseload power. We don't need baseload power. We don't need to pay extra for nuclear. We don't need to pay extra for nuclear because it's more react reliable. It isn't more reliable. Why would we pay extra for nuclear? Any place we're talking about the possibility of nuclear plants going up, we should always ask the question, why should we pay more for nuclear? And be prepared to answer any answer that they come up with with an answer of our own that says, no, you're wrong. You are wrong. <laughs> there is no need for nuclear power today. There is need for the nuclear, uh, New England coalition to be prepared to answer the proposals that are being made across the country for new nuclear reactors and say, we don't need that. There's nothing good about it. It's a new tool for us. It's in addition to the tools that we've had in the past that are all valid. There have been 11 meltdowns that we know of. And if you look at the nuclear um, uh, safety analysis, that was the third thing. Remember I said there were three different kinds of numbers? The third kind of number is numbers that are off by an order of magnitude. And the safety analysis numbers are off by an order of magnitude. In the number of reactor years we've had, we should have had a total of one meltdown. But we've had Three Mile Island, and I'm just counting reactors that were put online here to produce electricity commercially. Fermi, one. The sodium reactor experiment in Simi Valley, California. Chernobyl, three reactors at Fukushima Daiichi, two reactors in, um, in France, at Saint Laurent. One in Scotland at Chapel Cross, and one more in, in uh, Czechoslovakia at Bohunice, uh, uh, Yuslevsky and Bohunice. We don't need it, and we don't need the bad numbers they're giving us. And I looked into the reason why the bad numbers are there. It's because they only calculate using numbers they can actually establish. And since they couldn't establish any way to calculate human error, it was left out of all of the equations. Thank you. Have a nice day.